Hey, we're going to start a new series today called Financial Freedom. It's our freedom year, and we all know it's everybody's favorite topic to talk about finances. Man, it's, if you're, it's your first time in church, this is, you turned up at a very good week. A very good week. You're right now, you're probably elbowing the person next to you. See, I told you they always talk about money. Um, it's not true, but we could talk about it a bit more for sure. Uh, actually, the first time I ever did a finance series was almost 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. It was the second year we've been leading the church. No joke, halved the size of the church during the series. <laughs> halved the size. And uh, I guess that says something about our uncomfortableness as faith and money intersect, which means it took me about five years to build up the courage to do another <laughs> series about it and teach the truth. Uh, and last time, only like 10% of the church left. So I felt like that was a big improvement, that we'd all matured and grown, and no doubt the 90% that stayed, a lot of the feedback I got, that it was just so helpful. It was so helpful. And uh, I've actually just been reflecting. One of, the, one of the most important attributes you could ever have in your life um, is the virtue of humility. And... Um, because humility actually determines how much you're going to learn and grow in every area of your life. And what I've found over the years um, of pastoring is that some people just like are on these huge, like we've been pastoring for almost 10 years, like some people on these huge like growth trajectories, like they're not the same person they were five years ago. And others of you, I'm not so sure that sometimes it's like, oh, I think they're more or less the same, just as cynical as they started. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I only say that to say that, like, you know, Jesus talks about how the word is like throwing seed, but what the seed becomes is really up to the soil. And uh, I love that as actually I've, I've done finance series here, that some of the wealthiest people in our church, who are also on massive growth trajectories, also some of the most generous people in our church, always come up to me, man, I got something good out of that today. And so I just want to encourage all the rest of us just like, let's approach the series with the humble hearts. We should always approach God's Word, because His Word is coming to do something today. Financial freedom. I want us to be free in two ways, uh, or moving towards freedom in two ways over the course of the next four weeks. The first is, is that I want us to be free spiritually, financially, that, that there should be a spiritual freedom come about us as money and possessions and earning and property and all of the stuff that revolves around this, this big idea of money as it gets less a hold of our heart and God gets more a hold of our heart. That's sort of like the big idea with getting uh, spiritually free financially. But the second one is really important too, and that's that we'd get more physically free financially, that actually we can engage in financial principles and wisdom. That means we become more free over the course of our lives, not more entrapped financially, that actually we should get more options, the ability to uh, follow God more fully, where actually our mortgage and our bank account balance isn't determining what we think is possible in following and serving the Lord, but actually we are free to follow Him fully physically because we actually have our financial area in order. So I'm hoping we achieve a bit of both over this series. See, the, but here's the big thing, um, is that it's a danger, and quite often we talk about financial principles, and I have a great series online you can check out, God, Money, and Me, that all talks about financial principles, and financial principles are super, super important, and we're going to get to them in this series, but the danger is if we have principles without the right paradigms, sometimes it can get a little bit convoluted. If we, all we have is some new principles for serving the Lord, but we don't actually think differently about money and possessions and our lives, what we can sometimes get caught in the trap of is either religious duty, or actually we can have some sort of Christian materialism. Uh, we can actually just, it can all get a bit confused, and we'll talk more about that. And so while we're going to get to principles over the first few weeks, I want us to talk about paradigms. Paradigms. We actually have to think differently. What is a paradigm? It's a way of seeing reality. And we all have them already. You already have financial paradigms. Some of the paradigms might be, well, if I earned it, I'm allowed to do with it whatever I want. 
A financial paradigm is whether or not it's yours or whether or not it's God's. Those are financial paradigms. Paradigms, we have paradigms around inequality. Where some people think it's because some people are so lazy and that's why there's a, and other people think everybody should be the same. And there's all different sorts of paradigms. But what's God's paradigm? How does God see these things? And the reality is the way you see things should be evolving. It should be changing. It should be growing in your Christian walk. So if the way you see money is the same as the way you saw it 10 years ago, maybe God isn't transforming your paradigms. Maybe all you're doing is trying some different principles, but not actually thinking any differently about it. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Man, that should just open up our mind just to be like, God has paradigms. And they are higher, and they are better, and they are different. And so if my attitudes towards money don't become different as I get close to God, I'd have to say I'm clearly not getting his paradigms. But here's what Paul said about being transformed in Romans 12 too. He said, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, it's not enough at the end of the series to just do some different stuff. We actually have to think some different stuff. And if we think some different stuff, then we're going to be able to discern what God's will is for the area of our finances, our property, our possessions, our inheritances, our care we savor, the way we see our careers, all of the stuff, our spending, all of the stuff around finances. We need a new way of thinking, some new paradigms. Are your thoughts more or less the same as the people around you? You know, those good people that you have around you. They're not really bad people. They're just good people. And uh, maybe they don't go to church. Do you pretty much just see money the same as they do? And if you do, you probably haven't had your paradigms transformed by God. We're going to look at some godly paradigms. We're going to look at the heart. We're going to look at the church. We're going to look at justice. We're going to look at eternity. We're going to look at stewardship over the next few weeks. These are ways of seeing money before we even get into principles. And so that's sort of where we're going. I have recommended reading because I love people who are learners. And so uh, some recommended reading I have. I've got The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. I know there's people in our church been like they're like Dave Ramsey is like their teacher when it comes to financial areas, and they have bought houses completely cash, no debt. So Dave Ramsey knows what he's talking about, okay? Uh, so that's a really great one for just getting in control of your finances. God, Money, and Me is a great New Zealand book. I actually have it here, and the reason I have it here is because we have a free copy today in Auckland and here and online. You can reach out to us and send us a message. We'll get this to you. This is a great one talking about principles, okay, of, of, of your money around generosity, around savings, around investing, around spending. It's a great book. You can pick this up afterwards uh, in, in Auckland and in here. So we got that one for you. We have... Um, Managing God's Money by Randy Alcorn. This is a fantastic book. It's a small book. So if you're a small reader, this is the book to start with. Uh, just a thin little book. But this covers everything from debt to different areas to managing God's money. It's a fantastic book. We've got a few more recommendations, actually. We've got, for those who want some deeper theological reading, this book's amazing. Neither Poverty Nor Riches, A Biblical Theology of Possessions. I would highly recommend this. It surveys every scripture in the Bible and what it says and what we can draw of that. And so I'd really recommend that if you want to go deeper. The Blessed Life is a great book if you want to grow in generosity, if that's sort of the area you want to know more about, The Blessed Life is fantastic for that. And the last book, not by a Christian author, by an Aussie. We won't hold that against him. He'll already be mourning after last night. But uh, The Barefoot Investor by Scott Pape. That is a fantastic book just of a way to organize your money and maximize your finances. You have to think about how to read uh, Christian principles into that, biblical principles. But I, I recommend the book. It's, it's great. It's really helpful for a lot of people. So uh, there's some recommended reading. Are we ready to get into today's topic? Yeah. 
Like, gosh, I've been talking for 10 minutes. We're not even in there yet. That's just the intro uh, for us getting into financial freedom. So we're going to start by talking about the heart. And if we have enough time, we're going to get to the church. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It'll be on the screens if you didn't bring a Bible today. That is totally okay. Um, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Sometimes Jesus loves you enough to tell you the one thing you lack. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Some context to this passage that we need to correctly interpret it and extract from it some of what God might be saying to us today. The first is, is that This gospel of Mark, which is the first gospel written, was written at a time once some of the apostles, probably Peter, probably Paul, most of the original 12 apostles had actually all passed away and died and were no longer in their apostolic role within the church. The church was being incredibly persecuted and people were losing their way in what it meant to truly be a disciple of Jesus. We're starting to enter into second generation Christianity, and Christianity is losing some of that fire that it had in first generation Christianity. And so Mark is writing a gospel account of the story of Jesus, but he writes it with a purpose, not just to tell them about Jesus, but to tell them about discipleship. So when you read particularly Matthew and Mark, they're both really written with this point to help you. They're trying to show you what following Jesus is supposed to be like. And they they orchestrate all the stories perfectly to get across their point. There's purpose in the way the accounts are crafted. The second piece of context you need is that Jews followed the law most religiously and most perfectly in the time of Jesus than at any other time in Jewish history. They had lost their land and they had been returned to their land and they finally started to take the laws of God seriously after a thousand years of pretty average history of obeying God and taking what God originally gave Moses as a blueprint for the way their society should work. That's why there's all these conflicts between Jesus and Pharisees and Jesus and Sadducees because these people are protecting the seriousness of the word of God in their day and age, and they don't want to lose their land again. They want to be faithful. And so here we have one of those very serious followers of the ways of Moses, of the ways of the law coming to Jesus. And it's important to know if he was a serious follower, not only did he keep all of these laws, he wasn't lying, he would have kept all of the financial laws pertaining to the law. And so this is not like some stingy guy. In fact, and Jews at, at this time, at the time of Jesus, actually gave three tithes. Three tithes. One, two of them every year and one every third year. They gave one, which was just their general tithe to celebrate the first fruits and honor the Lord and celebrate the Lord, so the 10%. Then they gave a second 10%, which was for the storehouse, that there might be enough for all of the Levites and the religious duties in the land. And then every three years, they obeyed the law and gave a third tithe, which was for the widows and orphans in the land, that there might be supply. So here's a guy who already gives away 23.3% of his wealth every year. And, and on top of that, he would pay temple tax. He would do his free will offerings, his guilt offerings, his sin offerings, which would all come at great cost to him. And on top of that, he would have the Roman heavy, heavy tax. And so he's lucky if he's got 50% of what he earns at the end of the day. But this is important to know the context. We're not talking about a stingy guy. We're talking about someone highly engaged in generosity and honoring the Lord in charity. And here Jesus still says, I love you, 
But clearly, as I look into your heart, there's one thing you lack. There's one thing you lack. It's this heart paradigm. It's so like Jesus to figure out when we're ticking the boxes with him. It's so like Jesus to be like, yeah, you've got all the principles right, but I don't have your heart. That you think you can tick your way into being accepted by God, but I'm looking for a radical discipleship that treats everything you have as if it's mine. This is, he's going after the heart. It's the heart paradigm. I actually read this quote, and I think it's good. We must go a step further. The demand that Christians tithe can become a dangerous thing, for it permits the false conclusion that the problem of mammon has been met and conquered. Should I read it again? The demand that Christians tithe can become a dangerous thing, for it permits the false conclusion that the problem of mammon has been met and conquered. This is what happens when we go principles before paradigms. Jesus introduces us in this parable to this idea and this paradigm that it's not about ticking boxes. It's not about giving away a certain percentage. It's not about, did you do this, do that, do that? Then you are all good and you can do whatever you want with the rest. That it's always about the heart. It's always about the heart when it comes to finances. So just a few points about that. Money can reveal your heart. If you're writing down notes, money can reveal your heart. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I think if Jesus was writing this today, he would say, The bank account speaks what the heart is full of. The receipt list in your wallet speaks of what the heart is full of. People often say, I mean, a friend, we're talking about this this week. Well, if I won lotto, God, if you would let me win lotto. Anyone prayed this prayer? <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Powerball's happening. Give, don't forget the Powerball number, God. I need that one. I will give you, gosh, I'll give you half. If you would let me win lotto, I'll give you half. And can I tell you, if you don't give God half now, you'll never give God half then. You're delusional. If you can't give God half of a thousand dollars, you're not going to give him half of a million. And that is because the, the, our, our money, our money habits, they actually reveal something about our heart. And the point is, is as we talk about these things today, some of these things for some of us should go, ooh, maybe I should go read my bank statement and go, what does that say about my heart? Money can get in your heart. It doesn't just reveal your heart. The next point is money can get in your heart. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. It can become your treasure. The whole point is in the Scripture is Jesus is trying to get you to treasure something that's not treasure. He's trying to get you to treasure something of more worth, something of more value. Don't treasure treasure. Treasure something else. We've all seen Lord of the Rings, surely. You shouldn't be here if you haven't. Um, you know Gollum and he has his precious. I don't want to do it. You know, I will do a bad version of it. But, you know, my precious. This is all, you know, it's all sneaky, you know. He's, it's a beautiful picture of what happens when you treasure the wrong thing. Something about it, you think it's so innocent to hold on to it at the start. It's a beautiful metaphor. But all of a sudden, it starts holding on to you. And it gets a hold of you. And money can get in your heart. It is, I read this. It is arguable that materialism is the single biggest competitor with authentic Christianity for the hearts and souls of millions in our world today, specifically those in the church. Psalm 62 verse 10 says, If riches increase, set not your heart on them. And I've heard it said this way, God doesn't want your money. He just doesn't want your money to get you. The third point is this, money can become your security. Money can become your security. Like with this rich young man, I think that's why he 
didn't want to let it go. Matthew 6, Jesus challenging this very idea says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first and all these things, talking of material things, will be given to you as well. What do you rely on and what do you trust in? When you have an empty bank account, do you feel anxious? And when you've got a full bank account, you feel at, you feel at peace? When finances are flush and there's lots of margin, you're, you're not kept up at night, but when it's reduced and there's, these things reveal what you're relying on, where your sense of security is coming from. And if faith, if we could sum up faith so simply, we would say it's trust. It's trusting in God. And the scripture says that anything that isn't of faith is sin. So any way of living that isn't trusting in God is actually living a sinful way, a way you were not designed to live, then our attitudes towards wealth surely have become one of our greatest causes of sin. Because it's become a way that we rely on ourselves rather than rely and trust on God. And we know from the Kingdom of God series that it all comes down to living a God-reliant life. There's a danger in these things. There always has been. This is the story of Israel. They travel for 40 years through the desert and they had to rely on God every single day for the manna to fall from heaven. Otherwise, they were going to starve to death in the desert. But the temptation as they enter the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey and abundant produce, is that they would move from no longer relying on God, but starting to secure their own future as they started to toil the land. And we know that is exactly what happened, that they forgot their God and they started living self-reliant. And this is the temptation that we have. It's why um, we actually need to find ways in our wealthier world for most of us to practice God reliance in our finances. Where in the Lord's Prayer it says, you know, give me today my daily bread. That should be our prayer. There's a reason why we're supposed to pray that way every day. Not because we literally need bread. Otherwise, we're going to starve for most of us each day. We've got enough in our pantry to get us through way too long. You know, so we're not praying the prayer in that sense, but we're praying that prayer to enter back into a God-reliant posture in our heart. God, I've got, I've got a 10-year plan, but I'm relying on you. God, I've got enough wealth to get me through, but I'm relying on you. That's why we pray those prayers, because of the paradigm of the heart. We should ask God to meet our needs, not our greeds. We've got to rely on God. And there is a tension between daily reliance in multi-year planning, absolutely. But it comes down at the end of the day to the posture of your heart. The next point is this. Money can stop you from becoming a disciple of Jesus. And it's really because money can be used to worship idols. That is what happened for the rich young ruler. His finances were the barrier for him going all in for Jesus. Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So who's in charge of your life? Who's making the big decisions? Is it the bank? Is it the bills? Is it how much you need to earn to get through this month because there's so little margin? Or is it God? If God said, hey, I need you to pack up everything and go, how much does that stuff, well, God, can I keep it and go? Do I really have to sell it all? Jesus has a way of like, he's not mean. He's just trying to find the things that are holding you back from the abundant life and the faith adventure. And he's not afraid to push on them once he finds them. Look, who's in charge of your finances? Is it, is it the idea of prosperity? Is it the image that you're trying to keep up with? Is it the materialism? Is it comfort? Is it your personal freedom? Or is it God? Because money can be a barrier to becoming a full disciple of Jesus. And the last thing is money can be a growth blocker. Luke 8, 14, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear... But as they go on their way, they are choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Their fruit does not mature. 
as for that in good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold fast in an honest, good heart and bear fruit with patience. The parable of the sower, which is where we begin, and we're all the way back there now, tells the story of all that seed being cast and the difference between what grows and bears fruit had nothing to do with the seed, but everything to do with the soil. This one type of soil, the third type of the soil, is the greatest temptation to us as Western New Zealand Christians today. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This one type of seed, because if you notice what happens, is the seed finds okay soil, and it grows up to be a plant, and the plant never withers and dies. It just never bears fruit. And it never bears fruit because it's distracted by the other plants around it, the other weeds, the, the cares of this world and the lures of wealth. And I've seen way too many Christians over the years become fruitless in their Christianity. They still have the form. They may still even pray the prayers. They still turn up to church. They have the form of Christianity without the fruit of radical transformation in their hearts and in their lives because of the distractions of wealth in their life. The lure and deceitfulness of wealth keeps many Christians as little bonsai trees, all form and no fruit. If we don't deal with this heart paradigm of money, we just create a Christian materialism where we give to God to get some more from God. And generally... Generally, people do do better as they become Christians in the West. And we confuse that with a prosperity gospel. Why do Christians generally do better in the West? Because it's a pretty fair and open market. And as you become a Christian, you normally become more whole. And as you become more whole, you do better at whatever it is that you set your mind to. And where Christians aren't being blocked from trading and all these different things, there is a prosperity that comes with that. But that's not the way it works everywhere in the world. And we need to remember that. I read a parable that goes like this. There was a farmer, a humble, honest farmer, and uh, he grew carrots. And he grew the most amazing large carrot, like an award ribbon-winning carrot, the largest carrot anybody's ever seen. And so he goes to the king of his land and he presents the carrot and he says, my king, I love and respect you so much. I grew this carrot. Not a great carrot like this will ever be grown before. So I wanted to present it to you out of the depths of my heart, just as a gift to you. And the king, as he was about to return and leave, said to the young man, discerning his heart, wow, you are obviously a fantastic farmer. I own a plot of land right next to yours. I actually want to give it to you so that you can be fruitful with both pieces of land. Go and be blessed. A nobleman overheard the conversation and thought, gosh, if that's what you get for a carrot, what would I get if I gave the king something even better? So he went away and thought, and the next day he came to the king with a prized black stallion. And he presented it to him. He said, king, I breed horses. This is the best horse I've ever bred. And out of my love and respect for you, I want to give you this horse. And the king looked at him and said nothing. And as he went to turn and go, he said, would you like me to explain? He said, yes, I would. He said, well, the other man gave me a carrot, but you were giving yourself a horse. And if we don't get our paradigms right with God, we get in the same trap. We are giving to God, but we're not really giving to God. We're just trying to give to our own futures. And I want to encourage us today as we head into this series, start thinking the heart paradigm with my finances. Don't worry, we'll get to some practicals. But just start thinking the heart paradigm. Where's my heart at? when it comes to these areas. Begin by being honest. Here's some of my questions for reflection. What does your bank, esta- bank statement say about your heart? Has money, they're on the screen if you need to take a photo. Has money got a piece of your heart? 
is a portion of your security tied up in money? Do we practice God worship with our finances? And is your attitude towards money holding you back from discipleship and causing you to remain a consumer? Is wealth a weed that has grown up around your life stopping you from maturing? And would you be willing to sell everything if it meant following Jesus more fully? These are questions for you to take in your quiet time with God, to ponder with Him, to ask Him to reveal, and to let Him lead you to a greater place of life.